welcome to today's webinar on understanding the benefits of strain gauge technology and OEM medical devices and equipment. Our presenter today is John Pacheco. John is an MS in Mechanical Engineering from Northeastern University. He's been at HBM since 2001. John, it's all yours. Thank you, Krista. Welcome and to the understanding the benefits of strain gauge technology in OEM you know, medical devices. Let's begin. We're going to start by addressing the strain gauge, how it's made, how it's used, uh, different applications, uh, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the integration process. What that is, is the actual strain gauge assembly, the part itself that the strain gauges go on, how we develop that, how we, how we build that to your specifications. Then after that, I'll show you some successful applications in different critical and non-critical medical equipment. We'll do a little summary and then we'll do some questions. So let's get started. Okay, strain gauge. I'm sure some of you have seen a strain gauge, you know what a strain gauge is. This is a linear strain gauge here. You'll see some rosettes, shear gauge up here. Strain gauges are made by a process of chemical etching. It's a um, two-layered, you start with a two-layered sheet of backing and metal, and then you place a photoresist over the top of the sheet. A photo tool is then built with the design of the gauge. For example, the metal here, the grid pattern. Then light is shot over that photoresist. It hardens over the area you want to leave the metal in. The sheet is then processed through an acid bath, which removes the metal from the rest of, of the sheet, leaving the pattern of the strain gauge intact. And that's basically how a strain gauge is made. How they work is very, it's just a resistor. So it's basically changes electrical strain into electrical resistance. Looking again at the strain gauge, we see that uh, some of the components, we talked about the measuring grid, the backing. Typical backings would be glass fiber, phenolic resin, or PTF, which I recommend for higher accuracy type transducers. The measuring grid can be either constant tan or nickel connection points. And then you have the end tabs. Let's talk a little bit about those end tabs and I'll tell you what they do. You see the loading here of the strain gauge. When the strain gauge is placed in an area of stress, it's glued on. And even though it's heat cured and substantially attached, you will at times get creep or negative hysteresis. In that case, what you want to do is adjust your end tabs. These end tabs act as anchors to the strain gauge. They physically hold on to the ends of the strain gauge and reduce the chances of slippage. So you'll see less creep and less negative hysteresis. In fact, if you open to it, you'll see positive hysteresis. Okay, so we've got the strain gauge. How do we use it? Quite simply, we put it into a Wheatstone bridge. And a Wheatstone bridge is nothing more than four strain gauges or resistors in this pattern. You have plus, minus, plus, minus. Excitation is put here. The gauges are usually placed in areas of designated stress. Excitation can be anywhere from 5 to 15 volts. When the bridge is perfectly balanced, you see no output. When stress is applied across the gauges or strain, you get an unbalance in the bridge. That unbalance is proportional to the bridges. The output becomes proportional to the bridges, which is why we usually say our output is in millivolt per volt rating. Okay, so once you built, your, you know how to use a strain gauge. How do we get the output to read? Well, that's when we go to a complete complete measurement chain. 
If you notice, you'll see that on the left, we're only showing one strain gauge with three gauges in the, actually three resistors in a completion circuit. It is possible to use only one strain gauge and complete the weed stone using conventional resistors. However, I, I recommend for more accuracy to complete the weed stone using four strain gauges. You would have a power supply which excites the bridge. Then you would have an amplifier or circuitry coming out that you could convert the proportional voltage coming out to either 0 to 10 volts, 4 to 20 milliamps, whatever output you desire can be done here in a gain amplifier. Then out to whatever recorder you choose. So that's basically how you would you would set up a measurement chain. Now, how do we build the actual prototype? What happens is, in many cases, the customer already has an initial idea of what he wants for a prototype design. Or he may say, look, this is what we have. We'd like to have something fit in between here somewhere. In, in, in either case, we can, we can establish a string gauge assembly. If we have to design something up based on the envelope dimensions you give us or the model that you give us. Now, when you do that, you also, you'd also be giving us specifications such as required output, stiffness, linearity, specs, um, impedance of the bridge, all that, all, all those types of specifications that we would use. Now, once I get a model, I would take that and I would do a finite element analysis on that model. And that, as you see up here, shows patterns of stress. This is a simple rod that I punched a hole in just to show. I constrained it on one end and I applied a force on the other just to kind of show exaggerated stresses across here and what we look for. And using other engineering tools, we take and we find the areas of stress best suited to apply those elements of the Wheatstone Bridge. In many cases, we may have to strategically weaken some of some of the, the areas in order to put the strain gauges to get the output that you're looking for uh, so that it mimics the actual conditions of, of the unit under the load. Once that's done, once we've established the model, once we know that it, it meets the specifications that you're looking for, then we'll go and we'll build a prototype, we'll put the strain gauge, Wheatstone bridge on it, and we'll test it, hook it up, send it to the customer for approval, and then from there, it goes to production. So that's basically how strain gauge and strain gauge assemblies work and are, are assembled. I'll show you some examples of some interesting critical and non-critical medical devices. Here's a situation where um, an OEM of a, a CT scan machine was looking to um, control patient weight distribution, get some precision movement, and especially a high, highly repeatable cable positioning, which, which makes sense in this type of machine. And that was achieved using a multi-axis load cell, shown here. So one of the benefits is you, that you get better imaging and controlled movements. So you're not scaring the patient or putting the machine in, into a position where it's not going to create the proper image. Next we would see oh, mammography machines. Yes, these these are naturals for this type of thing. The, um, the applied force onto tissue, because patients come in various sizes, the amount of force varies as well. And to reduce the amount of discomfort to the patient, it would be good to know what the amount of force is under different conditions. And that can be established by using a force sensor on the table in the, between the plates to establish that, provide more comfort to the patient, and still get the highest possible image resolution. 
And I have a better picture of this. Yeah, you can see this here. This is one of the load cells that we use in a mammography machine. Some multi-axis. We do have some single axis out there in the field that measures simply force on the plates, and they work wonderful. They they do the job. Technician is able to adjust the proper force that he needs to take his, his measurement and get his resolution. One of the more typical uses is medical mobility. And there's, I can't think, there's many, many possible different types of, of uses for strain gauge assemblies in, in medical mobility. Two of them on a bed, for example, um, in many cases what we've done in the past, we've put a handle in the back on motorized platforms so that an aide or a nurse can actually steer the bed through hallways, into another room, take a patient for exams, whatever. Also, side handles are often mounted to allow the patient to be rolled over to prevent pneumonia and um, yeah, pressure ulcers that can be caused from a patient staying in one position too long. So that, that's some of the things we, we use strain gauge technology in the beds. Uh, one of the other things would naturally be lift systems. Patient lift systems are, are very important device to move patients from gurneys to examination tables, from beds to baths, whatever. These these are used quite often in hospitals. And the ability of the strain gauge assembly to allow smooth movements to adjust the weight distribution, center of gravity, and control speed and consistency of movement is really, really helpful. That's one of the ways that we use one of the monitors up here for weight distribution. This here is a weight chair. You can see the actual transducer here on the side attached to the bracket. This transducer fits in here. The bracket is attached to the top of the, the chair on here. The chair is attached to the other end of the strain gauge assembly of the transducer. When a patient sits here, he causes a force to the transducer, which is then read on the readout up here on, on the handle. So there's a lot of different possibilities for this. As you can see, there's a little better picture of the actual transducer here, the different type of assembly. You can see it installed here with the cable coming out that would plug into uh, a monitor device. And they can be used in various types of applications, veterinary, pediatrics. In fact, we built a, a, a transducer system that goes in the bottom of the metal plate on a baby scale that's used in delivery rooms of hospitals. That was one of the many medical devices that we installed strain gauge assemblies into. That's one of the digital readouts integrated with the load cell. You can see where the base of this attaches to the post, the seat attaches here, and you have your readout. All nicely integrated into one unit. Now, remote robotic surgeries. There's been a trend in robotic methods for orthopedic surgery. In fact, we've seen a lot of um, requests for different applications. And we're in the process of, in fact, of, of making some right now. One of the ones that we've made in the past was a system that where a surgeon can remotely operate on a patient with the same accuracy as being on site. The, the device actually measures the depth of the force and the drill bit force on, on remote hip surgeries. So you can imagine the need for high accuracy in such a situation of tens of thousands of an inch. Then we would mount another sensor to measure the flexion of the drilling motion, which would, cons which would consistently ensure the patient's position at the same time. 
That's a couple of different applications we've used. Some of the other robotic assemblies have been used for braking systems, for example. A surgeon grabs a drill attached to a robotic arm program to go in and perform surgery on a bone or whatever, and you see he's moving around inside. That sensor will only allow him to go so deep, will only allow him to go so far up, so far to the left. If he moves or attempts to move deeper than he should, it will actually stop him from going that far. So those are some of the kind of things that, that we do um, for surgical. In medical infusion pumps, in syringe pumps, we use uh, very smaller, these are small assemblies, some are sub-miniature configurations to control fluid output such as insulin. Uh, this particular unit is used on, uh, on the body to incrementally provide insulin and it, it gets feedback from a blood glucose, I'm sorry, a blood glucose machine monitor with addition of, of, an, of patient override. So if the patient needed to adjust, make an adjustment, he could. Normally it would be set up automatically. Um, in fact, the process is, it, it has worked so well that it's been incorporated in, in, as an industry standard in some of the world's leading insulin manufacturers, machine insulin pump manufacturers. Uh, some of the other ones that we've used are um, the tube clamp where we create a blade, a one and a half pound force strain gauge assembly on a blade type assembly which mimics a perfect spring and returns to zero when flow stops. So it's also very good at sensing fluid loss or empty bags and can be used for intravenous anesthesia pain management therapy, and blood transfusions. They work extremely well. For kidney dialysis, we've used strain gauge assemblies in weighing of canisters of blood, waste flow, and hanging intravenous fluids. This ensures consistent therapy delivery in a kidney dialysis system. And last, what next? Strain gauge assemblies can be used literally anywhere. And look at this, we can even fix your back. No, I believe this was a test for stress of the lower back spine with, uh, for concussive head trauma, if I'm not mistaken, they were looking at the stresses applied to the spine when you, uh, when you're in an accident and you get a real good head bang. So you can see that you can virtually put a strain gauge almost anywhere. Okay, in summary, we found that strain gauges are, and their uh, assemblies are relatively sim simply constructed. They're relatively low cost in design. Many, many uses for accuracy and repeatability. There's seamless device integration, and overall, the end result is better patient experience. Thank you for listening to, the, to our webinar today, and if you have any more information or would like a copy of the white paper on understanding the benefits of strain gauge technology in OEM medical devices and equipment, you can write down this address here and get a free download, and you'll get a copy of the white paper on, on medical devices and equipment.